Uh, if you want to shoot the first question to me, go ahead. Oh, uh, have you ever experienced wood kind of a communicate? I mean, not wood, but have you ever experienced any of the arts that you create kind of communicating with? You? I think it's all the time. It's psychological, but uh, it seems that if it's saying something, it kind of make it concentrate on what it's saying. And when you get through creating that, I mean, that feeling is gone. I mean, you can't get that feeling no more on another well, project. Well, that, that's, that's not only what you call rare, but that's an original touch. I mean, once you get it, it it's for that particular piece of material that you're working with. And once you finish the concept, because a concept is something that is born, but it may be born out of a seed, something as tiny as a seed. Right. So for you, your thing and what you're working with goes all the way back to the seed of the plant that made the tree because you're working with wood and each piece of wood was different from the other. But each piece of wood came from nature, the growth that it grew through. It came from the seed, then the planted in the ground because I was asking Matt, the, uh, I think it was the other day, as we led up to the conversation, did you know where the piece that you did, the slaves, and not the slave, the hanging guitar, was that on a plantation or not? I have no idea about the plantation, but uh, Tim was real thorough in his research. He found out where the tree stood, where the church stood, where the boy was killed, where the uh, girls was at the house. I mean, he done. He was real thorough. He got all that information. He tried to give it to me, but I refused to know anymore. So I, the so the so the tree was in a churchyard. Yeah. Really. And, According to what Tim said, said it was a church that named something other, but after after a while over with some for, for some reason they burned the church down and uh, they had already harvested the tree seed. And the people took and harvested the tree, took it to the sawmill, and each one got a certain amount of it. Now this is I don't know this. I'm saying behind what I was told. And uh this guy way uh sold me the wood. He he was he died at ninety one years old. He had to have been about ninety when he sold it there. And uh, just as I was putting it on my truck and everything, he looked at me. He said, uh, "Freeman, sir, you might not want that that wood that." And uh, then he told me he said there was a, a man uh, hung on that tree. So I told Tim when Tim was uh, over there about the wood, and uh, he seemed as to me he wasn't interested. Uh, a few weeks or maybe months, ago, how long it was, he came back, he had evidence. He told me, he said, uh, here when the, the man was hung, here how he was broke out of jail, here how many folks attended the uh, killing of the man and this and first, I told him, I don't know no more. I said, I got to live right here. Mm. But uh, he has all the documented evidence of mm. that tree. And uh strange thing about that tree line. One night I was out there uh had my uh, white brush brushing off some knots and stuff and uh and I looked at it. I said, now this can't be. And I kept looking and everything, and it was a form of a human school. Here come Tim again. And I said, so Tim, I said, look at that and see what you see. We talked it over. So I enhanced it a little bit, here and there and everything, and dug the grooves out deeper. It, it actually wasn't nothing but a knot. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But it, after I got it all, uh, so you could tell what it was, there it was. It's right back behind me on that uh, backdrop, you call it. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. I said to myself, I said, Dad, kept messing with it, messing with it, and here come other stuff. So the last piece of wood was a piece about that wide and about that thick, had a big knot on it. Tim said, uh, what are you gonna do with that? I said, I don't know, it ain't wide enough or any this to make it anyway. 
I took my wooden mallet one day, I was beating on that knot, and you ain't gonna believe what fell out in there. The two pieces of wood fell out in there. When you set them on top of each other, was the identical to a shoe. So I got all the ragged edges off and, that, and sanded it down and all, put some clear on it, and it was a shoe. I mean, a whole lot of stuff were already there. I enhanced it and everything. Was a chip? No, it was a knot. It was I'm saying a, what you, when you finally sanded it down and everything, what did it turn into? A shoe. It was already shaped like a shoe, but it was a it, knot. Yeah, a shoe, yeah. Uh, and uh, I said, dang, I, that, that it can't be. And it kept right on producing different objects and everything till I felt like the tree was trying to, trying to tell something. But I didn't want to hear it because I got a leaf right here. Yeah, I understand that, but then our uh, your yep. history. Yeah, and uh, another thing too was uh, it took and inspired me to do some more things and uh, to look at what I was doing with different concepts that we would do. You uh, know. Well, have you been making guitars lately? Yeah. I, uh, like, like, tell me something. If you had the right adhesive, could you take the little bitty chips and cuts and could you could you kind of bind them together like a puzzle? Let's 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 think let's think a work of art now. Let's not think uh or a guitar that somebody's gonna pick up and play. Just think of, of something that you would be putting together as a art object. And but you wanted to still be on a style of a piece of music, right? So yeah. that means all of these little things that came out of that tree is just as powerful as the guitar you first made. But how do you actually come, how you put these things together and then say, now I, I was never intending for this to for nobody to pick it up and play it. I got inspired with the conversation with me and Lonnie. We sit down and we talked about a work of art, a beautiful because what I'm looking at the backdrop of what's behind you right now. And that's beautiful. It's almost like a little bit of abstract. I could I could concentrate on it and 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 focus on it, and I could see a lot of your works, and but I'm seeing a lot of cuts. I'm seeing a lot of things that your dig outs and everything, and but that that makes me ask the next question: Have you been making any guitars lately? Yeah, I got some uh, some real terrible looking stuff over there laying around. I ain't finished it yet for one simple reason. This telephone and the interviews and the folks going and coming, I tell y'all, get get a chance to do too much work. I don't I don't know what the deal is. I hate to close the door and uh, lock up in here because this place get mighty hot. Yeah, I, I noticed that when we was there, but sometime uh you may just have to tell Tim and, and, and ladies and gentlemen, Tim is actually the director of Music Maker, and Music Maker is a foundation to me that helps, that helps artists, musicians. It, it, it makes a better way for us to understand why certain humans did and lived with their habits of doing certain music and certain contributions that was made by these African-Americans, Blacks, Coloreds, or all the way back to when they call us Negroes. Or you got to remember the musicians of what make a musician came with us from slavery. They brought us from Africa. Therefore, these rhythms and all of this good old stuff, they, we were born with this stuff. So or to enhance it as Freeman was saying, for us to enhance it and show you the trouble that we had 
to go through just to get our pranks across and how a lot of our pranks and views were stolen and somebody else ended up making it and then the people that really made it didn't get any credit at all. Would you agree with me on that? Yeah, uh, for one simple reason. With uh, speaking about the wood, see a whole lot of folks slip. <clears throat> they come in your place and think they ain't looking at. Oh, they're so friendly. And I had some uh, highly figured wood stashed over in the corner. Here a meal with telecasters, stratocasters, and uh, rare guitar from Lightning Wheels and them. They, they, they didn't bother that. They went in there and stole that the that, that, that highly figured wood that me and Tim had. Uh, we had uh, agreed that you know what it was. They went in there and stole it. They had seen some of the instruments that I was working on and uh, and enhanced that uh, stuff we were on it. And uh, they went in there and it had to be a professional crook call. If he was going to the pawn shop, I mean, there were a whole lot of stuff in there he could have took. He only got them the best two pieces of wood out of that whole crowd. He showed them. So he had to know what he was doing. Uh, evidently, you know who they do. But again, it's all about diminishing or trying to put, as I would say, a mask on our creativity. And that's that's not just that's, that's just not gonna work. I think I I think out of and think about this. I I'm just seeing so much being wasted at this time, and so many things that is being governed to help the waste come along. Not not just billions, but this is trillions of dollars. I know that trillions of dollars. You're right about that. Trillions of dollars. And a lot of the people that need uh, funding or uh, need their business uh, financially supported is not getting none of that money at all. The, the number one thing that bothers me about what well, I tell you about the wood wire, which ain't interesting, why did that guy steal them two pieces? A lot of times if a person know what he or she is getting and knows the value of it, they know what what their intentions are with it. You understand what I'm saying? I understand you real good. The whole, the whole thing is let's not put it beyond anybody because just like you or I, when we pick up something, like you say, it has a spirit. It's got it. You're right. And then it. when we pick it up, we know to be very careful with that because this thing contains something that is going to help the world recognize its value, no matter whether it's iron, wood, or it's a root, or it's sand. You know what I'm saying? My thing is. As, as as I grow to be an artist, I had to grow to learn. I mean, you know, it's a, it's about instruments, but it's, it's, it's sometimes if we look at how things become a part of our subject or, or what we are talking about, the heat factor of any given thing, I still could hear you, Freeman. I right, okay. Think, uh, any given time, that we are having issues with our global warming or anything else like that. We got to understand how this can affect the matchbox effect. You know what a matchbox is. I know what you're And how them old time matches, it didn't take very much for them to ignite. Exactly. And one of them ignited, ignited the other. Oh, well, you know it. The whole what? The whole box was on fire. You understand what I'm saying? Exactly. But a lot of us, we don't read the manual. We just buy stuff. You leave it on top of the stove. You strike the match. You leave it on top of the stove. The stove get hot. The whole 
thing ignites and therefore you got a fire. You understand what I'm saying? So, yeah. so for us, like we say, everything got a spirit about it. And therefore, if we have learned what that deadly spirit is, and that's the reason why I'm saying the, the hangman tree guitar is a powerful piece. And just the little knots and the little bitty uh, remnants of after you cut the guitar out, I'll gather all of them up. Right. I'll gather all of them up. And at some point when you ain't doing nothing, put them together like a puzzle. And they're still going to be another something for you. You're going to understand. It's almost like Ezekiel was down in the dry bones and he started putting the bones together. And once he put the bones together, he understood the humanity. Not just one human body, but he, he understood the whole humanity. He, uh, the whole effort of us as a people. You understand what I'm saying? Yeah, so that, that those little bitty pieces still have something to say to you. It's just that you want to, okay, now you want to look for them, put them in a bag. I will put them in a, in a bag. I will put them in a dark bag, in a black bag, just to put that, that feeling or let that energy be in there. And then once you take that out of there and put them together, get the right glue, get the strongest wood glue that you can get. And then you put that together. What are you using? Are you using a Gorilla Glue or, or Elmer's? I like hide glue, but it's got hard to get. So I uh I use a gorilla glue and it's so nasty, you know, that you hard to clean the edges up. So I have learned how to use the gorilla glue by dampening the product and putting one drop. Instead yeah, that glue, go that gorilla glue is a once you get it on, it dries so fast. Yeah. You, you have to be willing to kind of clean up afterwards and just like you say, that clean up after that. But that uh, my thing with the with the Elmer's glue is that the Elmer's glue would turn white on you if you ever noticed it once right. water hit it. Once water hit it. Now, as far as the white Elmer's glue, the clear, the humidity that get between it and its surface, its sealing surface. At some point, the humidity that just comes between that is going to turn loose. I did some projects where I worked with wood with the children in different schools and things, and they called me back a year later and said, Mr. Holly, your, the work that you work with the kids is just falling apart. So I had to study the humidity that gets behind or between the wood, you know, between winter and then the winter causing the uh, dampness all over the house. The winter do. Once they, the snow and all that other stuff, you gotta wait until the house get completely dry in the summer. That's when a lot of the different types of wood is not good for people to use in building houses, but they just, you know, they feel, okay, I want a million dollar house. I want a big glorious home, but they just don't know because of trying to cut corners and, and you the person to advise them, you just don't use anything to get something firm together. I, uh, after 51 years of this and that, and first one thing and, a be and another, the best results I got was uh, besides high glue with tight, uh, Franklin tight bone. But now they have changed some of that to polyurethane and uh, Epoxy, but if you can find the old Mala Amber Franklin tight bond and the man down here that's got it, it's old and you buy it as it is, but some of it is still good. Okay, that, that's more like a paint project prop. No, that's uh, a Franklin tight, Franklin tight bond in the, in the original name there, or that was. Okay. We use the glue, we use the glue quarter song parts and pen. And uh, it dries hard enough until it don't uh, dub the sound, it enhances it. Listen, listen, I wanna ask you this because that's gonna, this gonna take you back. But when did you create your first guitar and what inspired you to do that? 
Uh, actually, I was messing with them, trying to sound good and this and that right there, but that was quite short because I found out yeah, a pickup ain't gonna do nothing about it. Pick up now and try to sound regardless where it's Japanese, Chinese, or what. But uh, what happened, I had a shop. Tend to be messing with guitars and did some first one thing or another. And I come out in there one evening and uh, something happened. Like, hey, you ever bumped your elbow and had that sensation? Yeah, yeah, I've had it a lot of times. Well, that sensation controlled the whole body except. My whole body felt as if it was music, and I heard nothing but music, and then right at the end of the music, because they claim I got perfect pitch, but I heard a sound. It was the most comfortable than the sound you ever seen. If I could have crawled in that sound and not come out, I wouldn't be sitting here today. But I never ain't, and it went away, just like that. I told the wife about it. She said, uh, hey, you been drinking? I said, no. She said, uh, I don't believe what you said, so I left it alone. And uh, about 50, maybe 40, 39 or 40 years later, here come Tim, and I told him about it. But he didn't poke fun at me like she did. And I was sitting there watching TV one day, and a man was interviewing some people. They had experienced the same thing I did. They don't know me. I don't know them. And they was on a different area. They experience the same sound and sensation that I did. Well, let me tell you something, Freeman. You got an ear that is rare. A lot of people say, what do rare have to do with it? But rare, you are born with something. You are born with something. You could hear the bird tweeping. Exactly. And then you can go sit in the guitar and you can find that same sound. You understand saying you can duplicate that same mean. sound. And I know this, and this is our first time talking. It ain't like we sat up and you say, okay, Lonnie, let's talk about the birds and the bees or whatever else. But these things that we as a people are born with that makes us so different and so unique the whole thing is, I sometimes ask, do America really know what she got? Or is it one of we call it, it got? As for as us the people. Because us the people is really developing into a much, much sharper branded people. Especially now that we have our computer management and all of these other kind of digital ways of doing. I mean, equalizers, synthesizers, and all these other things that go along with enhancing one little bit of music, where it once were a what? A wooden whole guitar. Now it's an electric one that you could, man, I'm not going to lie to you. I commend you on being in the electronics. But a lot of people don't understand this, and they won't understand it, and they are trying to deprive you of the type of appreciated what was done before a lot of these young people even picked up a thing called electric guitar. You had it going on, and you still got it going on. So I would not let nobody make me feel bad about what the spiritual intention of my life has been and is all about and will be all about because your legacy is still being added on to what you hear the way you hear it, uh nobody else cannot hear it that way nobody else cannot hear it that way that's the reason that that piece that you got in the museum it's in the museum in London. It is. And it's, that, it's the piece that off the hanging tree. That's a spiritual, that's one of the most spiritual things. When I looked at it, I said, oh, wow. Is this the one that he did? Because Tim had told me about the piece of wood. Right. Said, is this the one that he did? And now as we talk, I can almost see this person. Uh, I can see it right there. I'm pointing to it right there. I can see it. 
I know I you do. Hey, it's that like this black man. Do you use you your imagination on this piece right here? Yeah. You can see the turmoil and you can see the suffering he did. I drew, I outlined the skeleton there and I took my uh, small tools and stuff and I drew a face to go with. I sure did. But I'm just I'm just saying, you could just see the eyes almost being popped out of his skull on this one. I'm trying huh? to tell you now. You're yeah, right. old oh, man. Because see, a lot of people think just by you choking like that, uh, it, it, this, this right here, first thing you're going to do, your face and your veins and your face is going to start swelling. You ever stop your blood from, you ever went to the doctor and they put that rubber band on around you? Yeah. Then oh. your, your veins just start pumping up out of your face. I mean, out of your skin. So once we stop the blood flow, then that's what be happening to the whole head. It's almost like the head began to create such so, so much pressure there until it almost bursts. Okay, the, the rest of the body is in the same format of swelling even before that's when the bowels breaks and the urine breaks. You do do on yourself and your pee pee on yourself sometime before you even did. Ready to point or death. You understand what I'm saying? First and that was one of the most abusive, that was one of the most abusive situations that a human could ever do to another human besides just literally burn them to death, tie them to a, a, a tree and burn and put uh, debris around them and burn them to death, burn them alive. Strange you mentioned that. Uh, I met a, a couple one time. Uh, one was a warlock and another was a witch. They came from Salem, Massachusetts. And uh, they were living down in New Bern. And they kept telling me about the magical powers and the world parallel. They started hanging out with them and stuff and messing around and they talked me into that uh, circle stuff, you know, everything. Mm -hmm. I found out that uh, it ain't all over when you leave this earth in. These something else. These something so powerful that you don't even want to think about it. I don't know what it would happen to them and everything, but as you said while I go about the burning, they said most of their ancestors were burned at a stake in uh, Salem, uh, Salem, I think Salem, Massachusetts or somewhere out there. We went to the church. We went to the church where Tichimo, Tichimo, Tichimo. Yeah, the Tichimon, the woman, the black slave that were claimed to, but she was an herbalist. You know, she was working with right. them, showing them herbs and things. We went, Matt, and I, Matt took me to uh, Salem, Connecticut. Massachusetts. Salem, Massachusetts. And we went in the, and we went at a time of the, the celebration. They had a big old festival out in the street. They had the streets closed off and everything. They had everything that witches and warlocks use, everything. But again, uh, uh, what that tree, again, the contents uh, and the values of what it is we are working with here in a spiritual manner that have to get our children to understand. You just don't pick this thing up and think you're going to get out there, boom, 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 because something's going to jump in you. Huh? Something's going to come in you. And if you, are you still there? I'm, I'm listening. At you. Yeah, it's something that's on the screen. But something's going to come in you. If you're trying to get something out of something, it's going to come out. It's going to come out, and it's going to come right into you, and it got to come out through what? Through your emotions. It's got to come out through your emotions. So uh, the, the next question that I want to ask you is, what kind of toys were you interested in a, as a child, or did you have many opportunities to be on the playground? Well, my mother, <laughs> when they had the epidemic of typhoid fever through here, it killed my brother. It killed. It killed all the older children on that uh, 
farm where we lived on. And uh, I, more, my mother told me to survive, but and that the survival left some uh, problems. She said, number one, I wouldn't talk, wouldn't look at folks about two years old. She said, three and four years old, I spoke a language nobody couldn't understand. You know, gurgle or gobble or what it was. And then all of a sudden, she said, I came out there. She said, but I was the only one that survived that type of four people in that area. Oh, so it, you actually, you actually had it and it kind of grew with you for a minute and then you grew out of it. That's what she said. Yeah, you grew out of it. So again, uh, again, now that you're older and have to look back at that and see how you are blessed because something happened in the process of you developing. For, for, some, for one reason, something happened to your brain. You must have had, had a strong enough brain to survive in the first beginning. Okay? We all got to look at what, what allows us to be who we are in our artistic endeavors. You are you're a special man. But you're you know, uh, one day was uh, a Tim and them were arguing with me about where I was born at. I told them I was born in Green County. They're going to make me be born in Pitt County. Now, let me still show you what happened. See, I smoke real food. I goes over there to the, uh, the big wigs and I asked them what the deal was. They said, well, now, hear what happened. By Green County and Pitt County, had arguments all the 18th to the 19th century. There was a line there. Like, you know, uh, you cross over with Green County, you cross back over with Pitt County. So what they did, they agreed to put a bridge there. When they put the bridge there, then that changed Green County to Pitt County. And yeah. that's simple. Yeah. It was that simple, and I couldn't understand it until the folks told me. Yeah. Now what used to be Green County and Pitt County. Yeah. Yeah, so, so it, it was a, it was a, it was just that one thin line. That one thin line. That one thin line. See, that's gonna be in your history. That one thin line divides you from. Uh, it makes you different from something else. I could it's not something. figure that. Not cutting you off, but this all uh, loom with me for quite a while. Who would think putting a bridge? Across the road, would change the name of the county. Never occurred to them. That's all they did. Went down there where that big ditch would put a bridge across there, and all of a sudden that was Pitt. I mean, uh, Pitt County over here. So I was born in, in Pitt County, but it won't name Pitt County when I was born. Strange. Yeah, I understand what you're talking about. Bring it to me. Thank you. Are you still talking? Yeah, I just talk louder. Yeah. yeah. Oh, got, Matt, you got something on on the screen as well. Yeah, you gave me a good idea, Lana. I'm going up there now. Uh, give me a sack. Well, you know, uh, get all the pieces I can find, and let myself be spiritually led to put it together. That's right, spiritually led to do so. That's what and I'm then saying. as you do so. Don't forget, you know, you got a camera. You take every now and then, you just take a photo of, uh, of because now you are in a, you're in a more of, instead of being the creator of more guitars, you're having to give definition to why and when uh, about the guitar that you have created. And, uh, again, another question. Could you tell me about how many you've created? I ain't never counted them. And uh, the guys have told me several times how many they were, but something like that right there, I forget real easy. It's the unimportant thing that I remember real good. Like I can sit with a whole group of people playing instruments, and I can tell you to a T, how many in tune and how many out in tune. And they ain't talking about the keys they use, and I'm talking about how many strings they in tune and how many is out of tune. I don't mm -hmm. know why my head do that. Mm -hmm. Instead of enjoying the music, 
My head be listening for horse and tune on the uh, guitar. I don't know why it's like that. You kind of draft towards uh, the instrumental sound pitch. Right. The same yeah, don't mean nothing. Yeah, the instrumental sound pitch is not that. Uh, I mean, if you wanted to, you can just make your money tuning a guitar. Uh, just, just as well as you tune a guitar, you can tune a bass. Anything that got strings on it, you could tune it real well. You know what I'm saying? But yeah. others don't want to give you that. They don't want to give you that credit that you that you got that much sense or you got that that type of hearing to do. And they they don't even now know how to do it themselves. They'll bring it to a print and think that they got uh, the the type of pitch that need to be delivered, but it doesn't really be. Uh, the pitch that need to be delivered. You sure right about that. And I'm it's, e even with me playing my keyboard, I know how much pressure to apply. So even though people say, "Well, he just picking and and just doing that," but it takes sensibility. It takes sensibility. And once we be sensitive and we understand that sensibility, we're going to play with that sensibility and we're going to respect that throughout our whole life. So whether they want, want me to change or not, that sensibility that when I sit down and go to playing, I'm playing with sensibility along with putting a little bit of rhythm to it and trying to actually comfort myself because I got to hear myself and once I hear myself then that's when that joy for it like the spirit say uh the Bible say God say make a joyful noise unto me that joyful noise is made unto us because God, if God is in us we make the sound unto ourselves. and then once we're satisfied with it it's the same as when I was a chef when I was a chef, I didn't like to be told how to cook. I liked it to cook and let you tell me whether you liked it or not. I liked it, that rarity, that originality, that is what people should look for from an artist. Not so much of getting one in the kitchen and then forcing him or her to do their thing. And I tell the children, the students, or anybody else that's got originality, Work with your own real originality. Stop trying to groove on other people's groove. You got a hidden groove within yourself that's waiting to come out. Find that and bring it forth. And that's what creativity is all about. Yeah, because uh, when I play guitar with different folks, some famous and none, some none, they always ask me one question when I get by drunk call. You don't do the same thing sober as you do in front. Of. They said, why do you punish the guitar so much? Why do you bend the strings a lot? I stand in tune no way. They said, yeah, it is. Let me show you. I can't show me, because I hear it in tune. Once you tune that instrument, I don't care about using a tune. You got that. They realize that they're going to be string stretched. They're going to be neck bending, because each string in tune going to make the neck do this and that right there. But like, as you said, you learn how to play along with it. And I like to bend the strings and stuff because that makes it the high tune sound like it's in tune. Okay, I, I, I don't, I don't want to hold you too much longer, but because you have the type of personality that you have, have people grown to respect it, or some people try to still act like, oh, he ain't, he ain't nothing, he think he this, he think he that. Uh, but I'm simply saying, for me, since I met you, since I met you, and I met you when you were living down there in that... In the woods. In the woods, on that plantation where the house was, and that big old corn silo, was that... I had three of them. You still down there, or you not? Yeah, that man gave me that farm. He gave me that farm in an almost brand new uh, Volvo uh, five-cylinder touring car. And in the process of doing this and doing that, I told him I was tired of it because he told me to let him know when I got tired of it. 
He said, find somebody we need it and give it to them. So I gave it to an old white boy. He put uh, what he called wheels and already had a Bose music system in it and everything. And every time I turn around, he thanking me. And I ain't gave him poop. It was a man to get, get loan me because I don't let him run to his soul. But in a sense, of, it, it were yours, and then because it had been given to you, and you gave it to him. But yeah. a lot of times, we we have we have a tendency to not take the praises like we need to take them. But I, it's nothing, it's nothing wrong with you at this time in your life taking the praises and saying I, I am thankful uh, again to Tim. I, where is Tim? I hadn't seen him in the in the. Tim told me when he was uh, last time I had hollered at Tim. Tim told me he said he was digging clams and loading trucks. <laughs> Hear what that means? Oh, he's up in Massachusetts. Some okay, Kate, Matt say Kate, he's up Kate, in Kendall. Massachusetts. Kate, some other. He said, Kate, what the name of it? Kate Cod. Kate Cod. He's up there with his mama. Okay, he's up. He, Matt said he's up there with his mother. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Well. Uh, you asking about Tim Marquette? Oh, oh, oh. Okay, okay. This one might. It ain't gonna hurt your feelings. But what about the time that you was locked up? Oh, I've been. Uh, I've been in the penitentiary several times. I went to the penitentiary for the first time. Thirteen years old. I had forty years, and uh, they changed the rule. They made all the young boys trying in the adult coke come back and gave them prayer for judgment. And during this time, the prayer for judgment, the crook gave himself up. He told him, say, you got the wrong man. I'm the man you look. Mm -hmm. They didn't believe him. They kept right on uh, doing the same thing. And the man kept right on and on till he took, you know, somehow got in touch with some big wigs and that would end there and gave me a clean slate for that. That was when you was, yeah, so that was a, almost like a a, a child at yeah, 14 see. years old, you being locked up in an okay. institution. But was that some type of facility for for children? No, they, they are. In Green County, the folks where wore the pillowcase over the head made all the rules. They made all the rules. So the guy we had committed a crime and everything, the man farm this thing, Mr. Murphy come up there and said, them good boys right there. They work hard and uh, I need them boys. Good, uh, Frisdale turn them right loose. Said, keep that one right there cause he ain't no good. That boy, they ain't no good. That's what they did. But see things that will change them. I really changed that much now cause after I did that, I got committing crime, professional crime thing. I could have had money, I could hire the best lawyer. And uh, certain things went on. As long as I kept my mouth shut. At the last John Brown, a big wig died. It felt like a John Brown burden fell off my shoulder. I won't listen at me. Listen at me uh, again. It's all about spirit. But listen at me. Uh, during your period, at your earlier age, were were the gang were more like chain gang. Everything that you all did, you did your weather change and stuff? Well, uh, then the way they done you, then uh, they they let you, they, you on the chain gang and not on the chain gang. Uh -huh. so they, they would go to the prison down there and get the young boys and make them work on folk farms so that people passing the road couldn't see them. That's the but way they did it. Uh. You work on the farm ditching and swerving and uh, it was what they need doing. They kept your heat. I mean, they rode you in a covered truck. But see, none they don't do that. They rode you in what they call a Hoover car. Yeah. But that's what they did uh, with us, too. They had us uh, on plantation picking cotton. Dry, you know, once, once the corn get pulled off the stalks. Right, breaking and you, had to, you had to go back over the, the whole field again. First you go down, up and down the field. There was three, three growth periods of corn on the stalks. You had a green corn, a semi-dry corn, 
and then that last pool would be the dry corn. The dry corn would be then you would the girls would take it and take the corn like that and get all the corn off of the car. And then it goes into the silos. The first corn were cut off, they was cut off and canned it. If you had you had two kinds of corn, you had the sweet corn that was put into the can. They call it Alabama surplus food because that, that's what we made. We we did that. The children did it. We canned it, all that stuff. So there were the sweet corn, and then you had also the corn that they called our uh, cream corn. Now, cream corn was not just made off of its natural cream. It had... Uh, a uh, stir thickener in it to make it become a cream corn once it was put into the cooker. They had the big steam pot, the big, big, huge steam pot, and you stood up over it and you cooked this big uh, batches of corn in it. So my thing with, because me and Matt are still discussing what happened in my life in Alabama Industrial School for Negro Children. But the reason why I had asked you the question about your life at 14, I was put in there when I was 11, and I stayed until I was turning 15 before they let me out. But my, my situation was horrible because I got a whooping every day because I didn't know how to pick cotton. A lot of the, the things that you did in the field, I didn't know how to do them. I didn't know how to do them. So I actually ran away at the time that we was pulling the corn shucks out of the field, we are pulling them up by root. You pull them up and then you knock them off and then you lay them down. And then another group of boys come behind you, pick the corn stalks up, throw them on the mule wagon and load them up. Then they have took them to the grind their roots and all and then they are grind up to feed. You understand what I'm saying? I learned all of that stuff. I learned it all. I learned it all. But the whole thing that I try to tell people about my life, I, I, I don't try to play with that. I try, I try not to play with it because I know it was a spirit. And I know what it were a part of my life. And it was a, because otherwise, why would I still be around? to tell somebody. And Freeman, I really, really appreciate you. Yeah, I appreciate uh, you. Uh, again, our lives had been hell of a lives, but in the end, we win. We win, my brother. So, so now, you know, like know. you say, if you get a chance, go and find those other little bit of pieces, oh, but also that. use what you got. I want to do that. That's yours. Use what you got until you get what you need. No, All right, no. say thumbs up to you now. Use what you got until you get what you need. That's the whole moral of our life. Hey, yeah, that's, that's pretty good. That's from slavery on up to where we are now. Use what you got until you get what you need. You're sure right. All right, thumbs up for Mother Universe. What a okay, young man. man that is. You have a good one now. All right.